still waiting. There we go, we're live. Hello everyone, welcome to a, another uh, neurology webinar from Mind the Bleep. Uh, this is our penultimate webinar for this sort of uh, iteration of sort of webinars. Um, today it's going to have a sort of neurosurgical spin really, being on sort of traumatic brain injury. Um, delighted to introduce um, Dr. Damian. I've, I've had <laughs> <laughs> Veljanovsky, is that right? Yeah. Veljanovsky, yeah. Yeah. I probably, it just, it's, probably should have practiced that before. And anyway, um, Damian is one of the neurosurgery academic trainees at Derrick Hospital in the Southwest, uh, in Plymouth, in the UK. Um, and he's going to talk to us now about traumatic brain injuries. As always, um, there will be feedback available uh, to fill out at the end. If you fill it out, you can get a certificate to prove that you attended the teaching. Um, so, Damien, off you go. Okay, can can you see the slide, Alex? Yeah, yeah. That's... And can you still see me? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, uh, I'll be speaking about traumatic brain injury. Uh, let me tell you what I hope we can cover during this talk. Uh, I, I think we should go over some definitions because we should all have a shared language or a shared understanding of the language of neurosurgery and neuroradiology when we discuss these cases. We'll go over some of the key anatomical concepts that are relevant to understanding patients that come in with TBI. We'll briefly go over the CT head scan, which is the workhorse scan of neurosurgery. We'll talk about basic physiological principles of raised intracranial pressure and how to manage uh, raised, raised intracranial pressure. And then we'll go over five cases. I think I, I want to stress that this topic is very broad. It's, it's also very detailed. And my plan is to give you an oversight of some of the key principles and scenarios that you might find yourself as a foundation doctor, or a medical student, or another healthcare professional, whether you work in a &E, in an acute speciality in hospital or in general practice. And I also hope to direct you towards resources that you can access to get more information. And for some of the cases, I've also built, I've also given some relevant research studies that have defined the practice in that field. So the Glasgow Coma Scale is the first concept we need to understand. It was uh, developed by Graham Teasdale and his colleagues in Glasgow in the 1970s. It ranges from 3 to 15, and there are two important things to always remember when calculating the GCS. The first is that it is the patient's best response to, to a stimulus, and secondly, it can change over time. So this means that uh, even with a within a matter of 10 minutes, the patient's GCS can change. It doesn't necessarily mean it was erroneously recorded by the person before, it may just mean that the patient has uh, improved or deteriorated. I'd like to draw your attention to this link here, which I'll, I'll leave on for the next 15, 20 seconds. It's uh, a link to a tutorial by a neurosurgery trainee in Glasgow, which brilliantly uh, explains the GCS and the physiological uh, principles that underlie why patients have a for example, a uh, motor posturing response. We can see here that it's split into three components, the patient's uh, visual response with their eyes, uh, no response to pain, to speech or spontaneously, their verbal response from no response to being fully orientated, and their motor response, uh, which, is, which ranges from no response to pain, abnormal extension, abnormal flexion, flexion withdrawal from pain and localizing to pain and, and the last one is obeying commands an important thing to note about the motor component is that firstly what is the difference between somebody who has a an abnormal flexion and a flexion withdrawal from pain the difference is that abnormal flexion is a very stereotyped response whereas flexion withdrawal from pain means that they are trying to, to go towards the painful stimulus, but they can't quite reach it. That means that in order for the patient to localize the pain, they should be able to raise their hand above the, above the shoulder region if we're applying supraorbital pressure. There are many ways to assess 
the, to stimulate the patient and to apply a painful stimulus, it can be either pressure on the nail bed or trapezius squeeze or, or supraorbital pressure, which, and, and these techniques work quite effectively. So traumatic brain injury has two distinct phases, which are essential in an, which is which it is essential to understand when we're managing patients. There is the primary traumatic brain injury, which occurs when the patient has has their head injury, and that can result in lacerations or contusions. And then the secondary brain injury occurs afterwards, and that is really what we are trying to uh, prevent or reduce the incidence of as clinicians. We can't really. Once the primary injury has happened, we can't really reverse that. But the secondary injury is what we can reverse. And that's what the remainder of this talk will, will focus on. We can also classify traumatic brain injury. This is a very simple classification based on the GCS and more complex classifications exist. We can classify it as mild with a GCS of 14 to 15, moderate with a GCS of nine to 13 and severe which is a GCS of uh, eight or less. You might remember there is a mnemonic for how we can memorize the layers of the scalp, the scalp mnemonic, which is shown here. So we have the skin and we have the uh, dense connective tissue, the aponeurosis. This is also known as the galia, and it's the layer that we suture when we're closing uh, a craniotomy. And there is also the loose connective tissue and finally the periosteum. We also have the skull and here we have the three meninges, so the, the dura mater, the arachnoid layer and the pia mater. The pia mater is adherent to the, to the surface of the brain. The blood vessels, the arteries run in the arachnoid layer, thus we have subarachnoid hemorrhage and then the dura mater has these uh, bridging veins that go into the dural venous sinuses. We also need to be familiar with some of the common herniation syndromes that we see either radiologically or clinically. It's not uncommon to see subfalcine herniation like this on a CT scan. There may also be uncle herniation. The uncus is the most medial part of the temporal lobe. And if there is mass effect from a hematoma, or a tumor, that can actually cause movement of the uncus medially over the tentorium cerebelli, and that can compress the brainstem structures. In particular, it can, it can compress the third nerve, the oculomotor nerve, and that can result in a dilated pupil with a down and out appearance. But the dilated pupil occurs first because the parasympathetic fibers run on the outside of the nerve. You, you've also heard of uh, coning, and that refers to descent of the cerebellar tonsils, as shown here. And this is the this is the posterior fossa, and this is the supratentorial fossa. So the CT head scan is the workforce, the work workhorse uh, scan of neurosurgery, neuroradiology, especially in the acute phase, whereas MRI scans are more useful in in following the acute phase. The CT scan works by taking uh, sequential uh, x-rays, which are then analyzed by the computer. It generates these images, which we can see this is from the, the bottom of the skull, moving sequentially upwards. With CT scans, when we're describing the appearances of a lesion, we talk about density. So whether a lesion is hypo, ISO or hyperdense compared to the adjacent brain parenchyma or skull, for example. We always compare it to something else. It's also measured by Hounsfield units, which tells us what the density of the lesion is. There, are, there is a nice mnemonic for remembering how to systematically interpret a CT head scan. So we, look, we firstly look at the blood, if there is any presence of blood in the parenchyma, in the subdural, extradural spaces, perhaps in the cisterns <clears throat> or in the ventricles. We then look at the cisterns, 
So these are the systems here. I hope that you can see my cursor, but these are the systems around the brainstem. We also have the, the frontal lobes here, the temporal lobes. We can see the posterior fossa with the cerebellum and the brainstem. And then as, as we move up, we can see the parietal lobes and the occipital lobes. We see here the lateral ventricles. We can see on this slice the third ventricle. And then as we move down, we can see the fourth ventricle. We also want to look at the bones, but it's easier to look at the bones if they're reformatted with that, uh, with that type of sequence. And we're looking for fractures because fractures can indicate an underlying, uh, can indicate both the severity of the injury and that there may be an underlying uh, parenchymal injury. So uh, if, we, if we are working in A&E, we need to be aware of the NICE CT head guidelines. And these, uh, here I have the guidelines for adults, but there are also separate pediatric guidelines. And these can tell us for which patients we should be performing a CT head scan uh, within one hour of the risk factor being identified, and then here within eight hours of the, of the head injury. I will, I will leave you to access these guidelines in your own time because, as you can see, they're quite detailed. But important things are the, the initial GCS, the GCS in a and &E, the presence of any fractures, any signs of basal skull fractures, such as um, battle sign or panda eyes, seizures, focal deficits, and vomiting. These are slightly different for children. And then we need to be very conscious of patients who have anticoagulants. I will, I will touch upon intracranial pressure. I will really talk about three different concepts, which I think are very re relevant to traumatic brain injury and how, how we manage patients with, with traumatic brain injury. The first is cerebral autoregulation. You may be familiar with this graph. This graph really is, has cerebral blood flow on the y-axis and mean arterial pressure on the x-axis. What it, what it shows is cerebral autoregulation, and cerebral autoregulation is the ability of the brain to maintain cerebral blood flow across a range of mean arterial pressure. We can see that the brain is able to maintain a steady cerebral blood flow of around 50 uh, mils per 100 grams of brain per minute between a mean arterial pressure of 50 to 150 millimeters of mercury. We can also see that the cerebral perfusion pressure can be calculated by the mean arterial pressure minus the intracranial pressure. So this is an important concept to understand because if there is anything which makes the, uh, which impairs the cerebral autoregulation, then the brain will not be able to maintain that cerebral blood flow and that can result in brain injury. The second concept is the Monroe-Kelly hypothesis, which I'm sure you've heard of. The, the Monroe-Kelly hypothesis states that the calvarium or the, the skull has a fixed volume and it contains cerebrospinal fluid, blood and brain. And so if there is any increase in one of those uh, components or if there is a new component such as a hematoma or tumour, then one of the other components has to decrease in volume. And that usually happens through, uh, through for example, herniation or a reduction in the uh, intracerebral cerebrospinal fluid volume. The Monroe-Kelly hypothesis is very nicely demonstrated on this graph of intracranial pressure on the y-axis and the intracerebral volume on the x-axis. This graph really explains cerebral compliance, which is the change in pressure divided by the change in volume. And we can see that as the volume of the brain increases, the pressure is relatively steady. But there comes a point when that, that balance is lost and the, and the intracranial pressure rises rapidly. And lastly, we can speak about Cushing's reflex, which was described by Harvey Cushing. He's regarded as one of the fathers of neurosurgery. And Cushing's reflex is a combination of a bradycardia an increase in the uh, systolic blood pressure and an irregular uh, respiratory rate. 
And this is really caused by a, a change from firstly a sympathetic output to increase the mean arterial pressure when there is uh, a brain injury, followed by a subsequent parasympathetic response that results in uh, the bradycardia and <clears throat> the bradycardia and altered respiratory rate that we see. There are alternate theories as to why Cushing's reflex happens. One, one theory is that the baroreceptors are stimulated, which causes that parasympathetic response, but there is also a theory that the vagal nerve is stretched, and that may potentially contribute as well. With regards to how we manage raised intracranial pressure, it's important to remember that there are always medical and surgical options. And there's always the option of not doing anything if that is in the patient's or family's wishes, depending on the situation. But whatever we do, we must use a tiered systematic approach in order to, uh, in order to treat raised intracranial pressure. We also need to identify very early on any causes of raised ICP that are rapidly reversible. The guideline that we, the main guideline which is used internationally is the Brain Trauma Foundation guideline, but each hospital has their own local guideline depending on local drug availability and local experience. These are the guidelines from my trust, and we can see that there are four levels of ICP management. We initially start with basic measures to try and optimize the patient's parameters. We also consider factors such as whether the patient is wearing a cervical collar and whether that might be compressing venous outflow from the head. We want to exclude common factors such as pain or constipation that can increase intracranial pressure. We then want to perform an urgent CT head scan to rule out any change that may be accounting for the raised ICP. As we move up the tiered system, we look at things like sedation and whether we can give uh, sedatives like propofol, whether we give any um, anxiolytics or muscle relaxants. We then move further on and consider hyperosmolar therapy, which can either be hypertonic saline or mannitol. And following this, there are other options such as inducing hypothermia. The last option is really either barbiturate therapy, such as barbiturate therapy and birth suppression, or surgical intervention, which we will cover later on, but the surgical intervention is usually a craniectomy. And a craniectomy means that we, we perform a craniotomy to take the bone flap, and then we leave the bone flap off the head, and can be either discarded or stored in the patient's peritoneum. Before we move on to the cases, I just want to want to show you two slides about how we should assess patients with head injury. And I think these are applicable wherever you work, if it's pre-hospital, uh, in A&E, on a ward, or, or in general practice. The most important thing, as always, is to follow a systematic approach. We want to use an ATE approach as per the ATLS guidelines. The first thing is to rule out any catastrophic hemorrhage as well as to immobilize the patient's cervical spine if there is any suggestion of uh, injury to that. We then want to work our way through airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. There was a major trial published recently in, in the past few years called the CRASH-3 trial. And this actually showed that tranexamic acid can significantly reduce, reduce the risk of uh, mortality when given to patients within three hours of injury if they have mild to moderate TBI. So this is really important and this is now entered into clinical practice and we routinely give tranexamic acid not only to major trauma patients but also to patients with traumatic brain injury. As we're performing the A to E and work and stabilizing the patient, we need to find out if they take any antithrombotic medication. Do they take warfarin for atrial fibrillation or do, are they on aspirin and clopidogrel? Do they take any novel anticoagulant drugs because these will significantly alter our treatment and possible complications in the future? 
We want to find out what comorbidities they have and what their perioperative risks are, because we will be speaking with the anesthetic team, the intensive care team, and we need to tell the anesthetist if they have any comorbidities that need to be optimized. And we need to have a frank discussion with the intensivists about what their direction of care is and whether they are suitable candidates for intensive care. We also want to know what their pre-morbid functional status is and whether they would be candidates for surgery. And by that, I mean whether they would have a, have a functional outcome that would be agreeable to them based on what they've previously expressed or what they, their family know. And that varies from patient to patient. We also need to constantly be thinking about preventing secondary brain injury. And we really do that by following, following these parameters and making sure that we're optimizing the patient biochemically and also based on their observations. One thing which is really important is asking ourselves whether the history and the mechanism of injury correlates with the physical examination of the patient and the scans that we've performed. Because if it doesn't, we need to ask ourselves important questions. So for adults, this can be for adults and children, I guess, but for, for adults mostly, I think, is whether there has been an underlying vascular event, such as an aneurysm or arteriovenous malformation, which is ruptured, that led to the trauma, rather than, rather, for example, if a patient fell, uh, fell down a flight of stairs, did they fall because they slipped, or did they fall because they had a ruptured aneurysm uh, with a primary bleeding event, and then fell? Because in that case, we would perform a CT angiogram of the head and neck at the same time as the, the trauma scans if the patient is stable, and that management would be very different. It would be, uh, it would be disastrous to take a patient to theater if there is an underlying vascular lesion which is not known about. And in, for children, we also need to think about non-accidental injury and whether that history and mechanism correlates with the physical examination findings. As I mentioned in the ATE approach, we need to think about the cervical spine and, and thoracolumbar fractures as well. I think this, this factor here is probably one of the most important in my, in my experience of, of, of the little experience that I have. It, it really, the early discussions with patients, uh, families or the next of kin are very, very important because these decisions about whether to offer somebody surgical intervention or not are quite difficult to make because patients come in at the extremes of illness, they're critically unwell. Often the prognosis can be poor, but it's not really that the prognosis is, it's, is poor, is more that the prognosis is uncertain. And so we don't know how the patient will, will, will fare going forward and really what is acceptable for each patient what one standard of living might be acceptable for me but it might not be acceptable to you so uh, this is why early discussions early early open and honest discussions with the family are very very important let's move on to cases i am going to if you if you can go to this VVOX website and if you can type in this number, I'll just open the poll and I hope that some of you will be able to start uh, connecting. Whilst you're connecting, I'll just read through this. So the first case is of a 25-year-old horse racer who fell off during a race. He injured his head. He loses consciousness but actually recovers quickly although he does have a persisting headache. A few hours later, he is taken to A&E and he becomes gradually more drowsy and actually loses consciousness. So for, for these cases, I think what we'll do is try and, uh, I'll, I'll ask you to give a diagnosis based on the history without doing the scans, without seeing the scans for some of the cases because 
some of these histories are quite characteristic. I'll just wait 30 seconds or so because I can see some people are joining in. Alex, can you tell me if uh, anyone can see the results? Um, yeah, we won't be able to see the results on here, but, but it's... they can see people. People can see it on the on the on the website. Yeah. yeah so I think, so mo most people have there's been about twenty one responses, but I'm sure people who are not on the website are looking through the options available. I think that most people have said acute subdural hematoma. Uh, so actually, this is quite a characteristic history for an extradural hematoma. We can, uh, specifically the fact that the patient has this lucid period where they initially lose consciousness, but then recover. They have a headache, usually quite a severe headache. And then several hours later, when they're being transported to hospital or when they're in hospital, they become drowsy and lose consciousness. So we can see here a, an axial CT head scan. And the most obvious abnormality is this biconvex lentiform uh, lesion, which we can describe as being hyperdense relative to the adjacent parenchyma. This is because it looks white. And if we look at the surrounding brain following that, that structure in the mnemonic, we can see that there is loss of the sulci. We can also see that there is a midline shift. So if you take this point here and this point here and draw a straight line, you can see that uh, the, the lateral ventricle has been shifted towards the left side. Another important observation is that there is a, uh, there is a hematoma under the skin, which suggests that this is the site of the injury. Now, a common a common uh, underlying injury, in addition to the extradural hematoma, is a skull fracture. And we can see that on the bony reconstruction, this is the bony reconstruction window, we can see that there is a fracture here. So what is the treatment for this patient? Let me open another poll. For, for those of you who are not, not on the website, the options are conservative, which would include medical management of, of this. The second option is burr hole drainage. The third option is insertion of an intracranial pressure monitor. And the fourth option is a craniotomy and evacuation. So four options, have a think. I'll leave another 30 seconds or so. And I'll just put the scan back up so that you can see. And this is the history. So 25 year old, he loses consciousness and he's in a coma. All right, we've, we've had about 22 responses. Most people have said 
that this patient needs a craniotomy and evacuation, and that's the that's the correct uh, treatment. This patient has a an extradural hematoma that you can see here. This is causing significant mass effect, and you can see there's a lot of pressure inside this man's head. So he needs to go to theatre emergently for a craniotomy to evacuate the blood and, and, and reduce that pressure. We can also see on this slide, we can see quite nicely why this, this uh, extra, why extradural hematomas have a lentiform appearance. And that's because they are bound by the cranial sutures, as you can see here. They're usually due to an underlying arterial injury, although it can be venous. And for, uh, and, and it's a common exam question, but also in real life, it's usually from the middle meningeal artery as it comes from the foramen spinosum that can be, uh, that can be ruptured by the skull fracture, which releases that arterial blood contained by the sutures. But th this is definitely a neurosurgical emergency. Patients often have excellent outcomes if they're taken to theater quickly. This is a drawing from Harvey Cushing in 1906 illustrating a clot, but we can see here a more modern uh, schematic of how we would perform this craniotomy. So you can see it's in front of the ear, this is the skin incision, and then several burr holes are placed, and this flap of bone is taken out. Then this part of bone, which is in the, the base of the skull, is taken away as well to give you a better exposure the middle, middle meningeal artery can sometimes be visualized as it comes from the foramen spinosum and that can be ligated to stop the bleeding. Case two, we have a, <clears throat> sorry, we have a 35 year old man who presents after a fall from a bicycle at high speed and he's unhelmeted. At the scene, his GCS is seven, so he's not opening his eyes at all. He's opening, he's uh, making incomprehensible sounds and he's withdrawing or he has abnormal flexion from pain. So looking at his pupils, his left pupil is seven millimeters and unreactive and his right pupil is two millimeters and sluggish to react. His blood pressure is 170 over 100, and his heart rate is 50. He's otherwise fit and well. So what do you think is the diagnosis based on this history? I've opened the poll as well on the website. I can tell you it's not an extradural hematoma, because that was case one. <laughs> so it's one of the other options. I would say, think about whether, think about what is the significance of, a left, of the left people being much larger than the right and also being unreactive. Think about the, uh, what I was mentioning about the uncle herniation and how blood can actually ca cause uncle herniation. And the second factor is this, his blood pressure is quite high and he's also bradycardic, which points towards Cushing's reflex and Cushing's response of raised intracranial pressure. Both of these things point towards a large unilateral lesion. So perhaps that will help us decide what this is. Just wait another 15 seconds or so. Okay, well, let me show you the results. So just over half of people have gone for traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage and the next most common answer is an acute subdural hematoma. So the correct answer is an acute subdural hematoma because this is a mass lesion that will cause this kind of midline shift mass effect. It will compress the oculomotor nerve 
causing this appearance, it will also cause a lot of pressure in the head. Whereas a traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage usually tends to be it usually tends to be quite small and it tends to be diffuse. So it wouldn't usually be large enough to cause movement of the head from one side or the other. But this is a very, this is very important because it's a lateralizing feature. It tells us that there is a lesion on, on one side. And in the days before the CT head scan, whether to do exploratory burrholes was decided by the patient's clinical exam. We can see another axial CT head scan. The most obvious abnormality is this predominantly hyperdense lesion on the left side of the brain. This is subdural because of its crescenteric shape. You can see how it looks like a half moon and extends all the way across, unlike an extradural, which would be limited by the cranial sutures. We can see that this is actually exerting significant mass effect. If this, is the mid, if this is the midline here, we can see how the septum pellucidum has been shifted all the way to the right. So there's perhaps more than a centimeter of midline shift here. The other thing to note is there is loss of that sulcal definition. We should be able to see the sulci of the brain quite nicely, but we can't in this situation. So what is the treatment for this acute subdural hematoma? Let me open up the poll. Just another 30 seconds, I'll show you the history again. So this patient is GCS7, so he's less than eight. He's in coma, and he's also been intubated and ventilated with this, this response. All right, let me show you the results. We have two options which are competing. So it's the, oh no, so we had craniotomy and evacuation, which is now the most popular option. And the second most com popular option is Burhol drainage. So this patient needs to go to theater straight away. The reason for that is that they have a significant mass lesion resulting in a coma uh, with evidence of uncle herniation. If that uncle herniation progresses, then the patient will uh, will go into cardiorespiratory arrest as the as those centers in the brainstem are affected. The operation for this is quite a generous craniotomy, and this this needs to be taken to theater straight away. So this is an indication for taking a patient to, to theater straight away. The reason that burr holes would not be effective for this is that with burr holes you would not be able to identify or control active points of bleeding. And that's the main advantage of doing a generous craniotomy is that you want to be able to expose the, the brain and, and see where, where the source of bleeding is. Acute subdural hematomas, these tend to be more lethal than extradural hematomas because a higher impact is usually sustained. And there are one of two causes. It's either a parenchymal laceration, so a, a tear on the brain surface itself with a very severe underlying brain injury, or it can be due to an acceleration deceleration, which tears the surface bridging vessels that I showed you on that slide with the, with the, with, with the layers of the meninges. So you can appreciate that if there are if there is cortical bleeding, that needs to be formally assessed intraoperatively and treated in terms of hemostasis. 
So bullet holes would not achieve that. You do need to have a wide craniotomy for this. The third case is an eight-year-old woman who's hit her head on a, on, a, on a door after tripping on the pavement whilst walking her dog. She does not lose consciousness um, and as well afterwards. But three weeks later, she begins to experience a headache, which gradually worsens. And two weeks after that, she actually develops some weakness on the right side of her body. And her family note that she is occasionally disorientated and confused. So what do you think is the diagnosis here? That's the first question. And secondly, you also note in your history that she takes warfarin for atrial fibrillation. So what will you be thinking about in terms of that? If any of you have joined, this is the number to log on to the uh, VVox app. So you can just follow this link or go to vvox.app and then type in that number and you will be able to go to the polls. Just waiting on a few more responses. Yeah, so I think this, this case is more obvious than the others. This is a chronic subdural hematoma. We have this classical history of a head injury that the patient may or may not remember. Sometimes it's quite trivial. It can be someone who raises their head and hits their head on a shelf. It can really be very, very trivial. But the right circumstances, the right patient risk factors means that they develop a chronic subdural hematoma. And then this is really the complicating factor here that we also need to address. So the correct answer is a chronic subdural hematoma. We see here an axial CT head scan. The most obvious abnormality is a left-sided crescenteric hypodense lesion relative to the adjacent brain parenchyma. We can say that this is 2.2 centimeters in maximal uh, width, and it's causing 1.4 centimeters of midline shift. We can also see that there is sulcal effacement. So if can you appreciate that here we can very nicely see the sulci, whereas here we can't see the sulci. This is because that, that brain is being compressed. Another thing to note is that as patients age, there is atrophy in the brain. So actually their brain can accommodate larger and larger lesions, which is why someone might have a very large chronic subdural hematoma, but be neurologically well because their brain has a lot of space. So for the chronic subdural hematoma, what would the treatment be? Let me open up that poll. Okay, have a think. We'll just give it 30 seconds for this one. So try to do it. Okay, so for chronic subdural hematomas, there are actually three options for how we can manage them. The first option is conservative treatment. The second option is burr hole drainage. And the third option is a mini craniotomy. Now, how we decide which one to do really depends on the patient's neurological status and how, how much of a deficit they have, but also what their risk factors are. 
So in this case, we have a lady who is neurologically quite impaired because she has really bad headaches, she has weakness, and she's also confused. So this that tells us that this patient needs to have surgical treatment. The question is, what surgical treatment? Burr hole drainage is the most popular option for chronic subdurals, but if the patient has lots of membranes, which I'll explain in the next slide, then a mini craniotomy may be needed in order to see those and actually break them up. We also need to consider the patient's comorbidities and their risk factors, and in this case, she has atrial fibrillation for which she takes warfarin, so that's really important. We need to reverse the warfarin with vitamin K and octoplex or beriplex, and we can also take the patient to theater for burr hole drainage, like this, and we also insert a drain, which we leave in for about 48 hours. Some, some centers perform a CT head scan before the drain is removed, others don't, and go by the patient's clinical status. This is actually a subperiosteal drain, but the drain can also be inserted through one hole and then it can be seen under the other, other hole. So risk factors are patients that have a coagulopathy. If they have a risk of falls, for example, multiple antihypertensives, and if they suffer from seizures. During the operation, there is a release of this dark motor oil fluid. And in terms of why they form, it's believed that they start off as acute subdural hematomas that eventually chronicify. There is an inflammatory reaction, and that causes the formation of these membranes that further aggravate the inflammatory reaction. There are two important studies that have been released, uh, one quite recently, which is that which showed that dexamethasone is not advisable to be used in patients with chronic subdural hematoma. And the other one is that we should be inserting drains such as this in patients. So if anybody is applying for neurosurgery training, it's quite nice to know these two trials and be able to, to say them in your interviews. Lastly, I'll just mention that we can, uh, we can evaluate the acuity or chronicity of subdural hematomas based on their appearances. Acute hematomas like this are usually within one to three days, whereas chronic tend to be more than three weeks or less than three to four months. When they're longer than three to four months, they, they become hygromas. And th there are various classification systems based on Hounsfield units that help us to differentiate these. Okay, we have two more cases, and I'm going to finish in less than 10 minutes. So this is case number four. There is a 40-year-old woman who, fa who falls from a ladder and she injures her head. She temporarily loses consciousness, but recovers. And in a &E, you find that her eyes are spontaneously open. She is confused, and she's able to localize the pain. You also note that she has a laceration to her forehead. So if you have a look at the scan, and then think about what the diagnosis is, Yeah, have a look at the scan and see. tell me if you can, can see what the diagnosis is here. Okay, so this is actually a cerebral contusion, as most of you correctly said. We can see here, this is an axial CT head scan, and there are these focal hyperdense lesions in the left frontal lobe. You can see them here. These are cerebral contusions, 
and contusions can be thought of as bruises to the brain parenchyma, focal points of bleeding. They can be usually, they're usually hemorrhagic. And these are actually very important to spot because if a patient has these, we most likely will be admitting, we will be admitting them to hospital for a period of observation. And these are patients that you close, you need to keep an eye on very closely because they can rapidly deteriorate. The reason for that is that there is, there can be blossoming of the, of the contusions. This is a lovely diagram by one of, I think he's one of the creators of Radiopedia, which I strongly recommend you visit for any scans. But you can see how over a period, over the first week, there is so-called blossoming or progression of these contusions with quite a lot of edema. And this edema can cause the intracranial pressure to, to, to be raised so much that a craniectomy is required. And that's usually a bifrontal craniectomy if it's, if it's like this. So the, 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 front, the frontal bone is taken off. It's usually caused by a contra coup injury, which means that if someone hits their head backwards, the movement of the brain forwards causes the injury. And it can be due to acceleration, deceleration injuries. Common sites are the temporal lobes, the frontal lobes and the occipital lobes. And, as you, and I'm sure you can appreciate the, the temporal fossa is a very small is a very small and tight compartment so there is not much space for an expanding intraparenchymal lesion and i just I, I the other thing i want to say is that in real life we see patients with a combination of these injuries so they may have an acute subdural hematoma with a contusion or contusions with traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage so often it's not it's not one or, one or the other it's not one or the other yeah these patients can also have complications such as hyponatremia, seizures, and hospital-acquired infections. So this is the this is the last the last case. We have a 30-year-old man who is ejected from a vehicle following a high-speed collision. The patient is in a coma at the scene, and the pupils are bilaterally sluggish. Uh, don't worry about going on the poll because for this one I'll need to show you the scan. Um, but bilaterally sluggish, he is intubated and ventilated before being transferred to hospital. So we don't really know what's, we don't know what this is. It could be anything, to be honest. But we need to we need to assess the patient and do a CT scan. So when we do a CT scan, we can we can see these quite classical appearances, and these are both axial. CT head scans. This is from uh, this is from lower down going up, and then we can see the there is this focal hemorrhage here, and there's another focal hemorrhage here. This is actually a diffuse axonal injury, and this is a very important entity because for these patients they can have a really significant head injury. And if it's very severe, the prognosis is quite poor. It's caused by, it, it results in these focal hemorrhage points at the junction of the white and gray matter. And it's caused by shearing of the axons, as I'll show you on another slide. So imagine that this patient is comatosed, they're intubated, they're ventilated. What would the treatment for this be? So this is our last, this is our last question. Have a think and see what this could be. What, what, sorry, what the treatment could be. Okay, just another 15 seconds and I'll close it. Yeah, so most people are selecting an ICP monitor. We need to insert an ICP monitor for this patient. The reason is that they have a, they're in a coma with a head injury, 
and the CT head scan does not identify an obvious surgical target that we can we can remove with an operation. Because they're comatose, they're intubated, we can't reliably assess their uh, conscious level, so we need to insert an intracranial pressure monitor to be able to evaluate their pressures whilst concurrently uh, pursuing medical treatment of their ICP as in the previous slides. So this is, uh, these are the different, different types of ways we can measure an int intracranial pressure. The most common is an intraparenchymal monitor, so a small burr hole is drilled, the monitor is placed in the parenchyma. Other options include a, an intraventricular catheter or a bolt catheter, and all of these are, are, are effective means of measuring the intracranial pressure. The Brain Trauma Foundation has these guidelines. These are now superseded by a newer guideline, but I, I think they're still quite relevant in terms of helping us decide who needs to have an ICP monitor. Diffuse axonal injury causes this tearing of the axons at the gray white matter junction, and we can classify it based on where the focal lesions are, if they're, if they're at the gray white matter. This is an MRI scan of the same patient, and you can see why an MRI is so useful to evaluate uh, patients that we suspect may have DAI, and it's also useful for prognostication. Secondly, if it's present in the corpus callosum or in the brainstem. So, the, this is um, a, a very important classification system. Okay, well, that finishes the presentation just under an hour. Thank you very much for listening. I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm very happy to present this case for you and I hope it was useful. We covered some key definitions and anatomical concepts. We went over the physiology of ICP and how we manage it. We also spoke about how to assess the patient with head injury systematically. Uh, or secondary brain injury. We went over extradural hematomas, subdural hematomas, contusions, and diffuse axonal injury, and I've shown you some of the evidence base. So please, um, if you can photograph this, uh, uh, this data form for some feedback. Thanks so much, Damian. That was really, really, really good. Um, it's definitely nice to hear about you know, other things in depth. Uh, the feedback link is also in the chat. Um, there's just a couple of questions, if that's all right as well, um, that came up. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Jeff Stewart has asked, can you clinically differentiate between chronic subdural and acute on chronic subdurals? Yeah, so, uh, so chronic subdurals, there might be a single head injury that happened several weeks back but if somebody has recurrent falls every few weeks or even in every few days, it makes you wonder whether they had an initial bleed and then subsequent bleeds that have caused this acute on chronic appearance. It, that's the clinical way. Radiologically, we can look at the scans and see if there is any newer bleeding as well as older bleeding. And that would show us a mixture of hyperdense and hypodense blood. The exception is if it's hyperacute bleeding, which can actually appear as hypodense blood, and that's the, uh, I think it's, it's called the swirl sign. You can, there's brilliant cases on Radiopedia. Brilliant. Uh, and then someone has asked the really question, which is, why are TBI patients at risk of electrolyte imbalances, especially sodium problems? So, yeah, so patients are at risk because uh, it's it's a number of mechanisms and actually a lot of them aren't understood very well. A friend of mine did a research study into this looking at which is more common out of cerebral salt wasting or SIADH. But there is a general stress response which impairs the pituitary and the, the pituitary gland. And we see either uh, the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone or cerebral salt wasting. Also, the patients are quite vulnerable because of being in hospital, they're often resuscitated with uh, crystalloid fluids, or they they have other forms of resuscitation. But uh, but certainly electrolyte derangements, in particular hyponatremia, is very common after head injury. It's it's not uncommon to see somebody with a sodium of 120 or 125 after a head injury, and uh, and it's absolutely vital to spot it early and treat it. Brilliant. Um, I can't.
watch it for 30 more seconds then we'll aha uh-huh. there we go there is another one have you seen any cases of pontine myelinolysis i can never pronounce the second bit after management of hyponatremia after brain injury I've not looked after somebody myself, but I know that there was a patient in an intensive care unit I worked in that had it or was suspected of having it. Uh, it was somebody who came in with a with a very low sodium, around 104, 105. They were in status and they needed to be aggressively resuscitated. And I think that one of the reasons for the neurological disability was attributed to that syndrome. But I've not seen it myself. It is quite rare. Um, and then Dean O'Connor, who, uh, hello Dean, who's regular, um, is, has asked, when you admit patients with contusions, how often do you re-scan them? There's often no set rule. It's often an individual decision based on the location of the contusions, their size and the number. It also depends on the patient's comorbidities and risk factors. So if they have a coagulopathy, or if they take an antiplatelet or an anticoagulant, then you would be rescanning them sooner. In terms of guidance, it's important to follow the patient's GCS. If their motor score drops by one point, that would be an indication to scan them. So if they go from being confused to only localizing to pain, that's an indication to scan them in general. And then a drop in the other two categories of the GCS, so voice and um, verbal and eyes, by two points. That would also be a an indication. And finally, we just had this question, this question popped up earlier as well about the formula for compliance in relation to the Monroe Kelly doctrine, uh, about whether it's change in volume over change in pressure or change pressure over change in volume. Um, uh- it may be, I may have got it the wrong way around on the on the graph. Uh, oh, we've been cut off, I think, saying the event's finished. Oh, oh no, it's not. Off, I think, saying the event's finished. No, it's not. Don't worry. Oh, no, it's not. Um, I think that's it for questions for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Damian. Um, th- um, thanks very much for coming today, everyone. We have our final webinar on Friday with um, G- uh, GHAB, one of the neurology registrars, um, just on neurological infections like meningitis, encephalitis, um, etc. That's on Friday at 8 o'clock. Um, definitely not to be missed. So hopefully see you all then.